יאללה. אוקיי, שבוע טוב, אברואן. שבוע טוב. Welcome back to me um, after a couple of weeks. Um, and uh, welcome back to Jeffrey, who apparently is now recovered. Um, so that's good. Uh, mm -hmm. Happy to, to see you all back um, amongst us. Right, we're on Shmuel chapter 16, Shmuel Aleph chapter 16. Um, those of you that remember, uh, we were talking about the relationship between um, Shmuel and Shaul. And there seems to be this, this uh, um, almost sort of schizophrenic relationship because on the one hand, um, Shmuel is very uh, fond of Shaul. Uh, and on the other hand, we've got here in, um, let me share the screen with you. We've got here in uh, verse two, Um, let me know when you can see it, please. Yeah, okay. So we've got here on verse two that um, Shmuel is worried that Shaul's going to kill him uh, if, he, if he goes and says that uh, he's been rejected. And we spoke about this last time. It's all a bit strange because um, Shaul has already been told at the end of chapter 15 Um, if you remember when that episode of the tearing of the coat uh, took place, we'll just let's just have a little look at it at the end of chapter 15. Um, there it is on the screen. Um, he says, um, here we go. Have a look at um, verse 27 and 28. Samuel then turned away to leave. But Saul grabbed the hem of his tunic and it tore. Samuel said to him, Hashem has torn the kingship, kingship of Israel from upon you this day and has given it to your fellow who is better than you. So we know, Shaul knows that his, his, his number's up. So what's he, why would um, Shmuel be worried that Shaul was going to kill him uh, over here in verse 2 in chapter 16. It doesn't really make, make sense. Um, it doesn't make sense because Shmuel was fond of Shaul and Shaul presumably was fond of Shmuel. It doesn't make sense because um, Shaul already knows that he's numbered up. And it doesn't make sense because why would Shmuel, the prophet of God, be worried that Shaul, a human being, is going to kill him when he is going to do God's bidding. That doesn't make sense either. So this whole thing uh, really makes no sense that Shmuel is trying to say, well, I'm not going because Shaul's going to kill me. So actually, what we see is um, that it, what it really is, it's an excuse, isn't it? It's an excuse for, uh, for Shaul Sorry, I beg your pardon. It's an excuse for Shmuel not to go. He doesn't want to go and do this uh, uh, thing, which is to go and anoint another king. Uh, we know that from verse one. Let's have a look at verse one again, uh, Leon. Hashem said to Samuel, how long will you mourn over Saul when I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go forth. I shall send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have seen a king for myself among his sons. So in, in the first instance there, Hashem is criticizing Shmuel and saying, what are you waiting for? Why are you mourning for Shaul? So again, we can see from that passage that Shmuel is mourning the fact that Shaul has lost the kingship. And he is being um, reluctant to go to Yishai uh, and to find the son of Yishai, who we know, of course, is David. Uh, but he's, he's reluctant to go. And Hashem is saying, well, what are you waiting for? Why are you hanging about? Now, I thought that was rather harsh criticism of Shaul. Uh, and the reason I thought that that was harsh criticism was it's not 
uh, it's not Shmuel's. I'm sorry, criticism of Shmuel. It's not Shmuel's job to to go and find a king. Why should he be be, be criticised for not going to find the king? Presumably, he was waiting for the word from Hashem to uh, to go and, uh, and and find a king, to go and uh, crown the king, to anoint the king. It's a bit unfair to Shmuel, I think, for God to say. What you're moping around for? Go and uh, uh, find yourself another king. Um, and if we compare uh, the situation with the passing on of the leadership, I suppose it's a similar thing. Uh, Moshe Rabbeinu was in fact, in fact, the king, if not in in uh, in legal terms, he was the the leader of the people. He was in fact the king. Um, and what happened when he was told that he was not going to lead the people into uh, the land of Israel? Uh, what did he do? Who can remember that? He begged Hashem. He said, please let me go and see the land. He did. That's right. And when he was turned down. He also uh, wanted to appoint a new leader. Yes, it was Moshe's idea to appoint a new leader he didn't wait for god to say i've appointed a new leader let's have a look uh, i'm sorry leon i never um i never got uh, to um warn you uh, hmm. can you find bamidbar chapter 27 please it's in parashat pinchas Midbar 27 while you're looking for that um, we'll um, we'll just uh, uh, carry on the the conversation here. Yes, Johnny, it's right that um, Moshe, as soon as he was told that he was not going to lead the people in, he was worried about his flock. Um, and if you are ready for us, Leo. Yes, yes. Okay, so have a look at uh, I've highlighted from verse fifteen on the screen, but go from verse twelve, please. Hashem said to Moses, go up to this mountain of Abarim and see the land that I have given to the children of Israel. You shall see it and you shall be gathered unto your people. You too, as Aaron, your brother, was gathered in. Because you rebelled against my word in the wilderness of sin, in the assembly's strife to sanctify me at the water before their eyes. They were the waters of strife at Kadesh in the wilderness of Tzim. Just stop Moses. there for a sec, Leon. Just stop there for a sec. So Moshe's been told it's over, right? You're done. You're going to die. You're not going to lead the people anymore. So we do know, Anita is right, of course, that, uh, um, that we, um, we it's, it's right that he, he begged Hashem. We had it in yesterday's Sedra, but et chanan el Hashem. Uh, and I, uh, I uh, begged Hashem, Va'et uh, Hanan is a gematria of 525, and Chazal say that he begged Hashem 525 times in order to get in. But that's not the first thing he does. The first thing he does uh, is, to, uh, uh, is as follows, verse 15. Moses spoke to Hashem, saying, May Hashem, God of the spirits of all flesh, Appoint a man over the assembly who shall go out before them and come in before them, who shall take them out and bring them in. And let the assembly of Hashem not be like sheep that have no shepherd. Hashem said to Moses, take to yourself Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom there is spirit and lean your hand upon him. You shall stand him before Elazar the Kohen and before the entire assembly and command him before their eyes. OK, let's stop there. So Moshe says straight away, before he even begs himself, he says, Hashem, you need to get a new leader. So you can contrast that with our uh, implicit criticism here of Shmuel, when Hashem says, what are you waiting for? 
uh, and we, we often compare Shmuel to Moshe Rabbeinu. We say that Shmuel was uh, um, in the, Shmuel in his generation was the Moshe Rabbeinu of uh, the time. Um, and we also say, Lo Kamba Yisrael Ka Moshe. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, no, there was never any other uh, a leader like Moshe. And this is, this is the proof, I suppose, in one way. Shmuel, who was the nearest thing we ever got to another Moshe Rabbeinu, um, he uh, was not in that same category that he was able to put aside his own personal feelings for Sha'ul and to go and uh, suggest at least uh, another leader. Um, and he had to wait, as it were, or he did wait for Hashem to say, I'm going to send you off now to Yishai. And in fact, uh, Shmuel says, I don't want to go. He's going to kill me. And we've just said before, he wasn't really worried that he was going to be killed. It was just an excuse not to go. Um, and that also is a comparison to Moshe Rabbeinu, isn't it? Uh, because when he was given his first task, um, then he was a bit reluctant to go, wasn't he? Um, what we've just seen is him at the end of his career as the leader, uh, that Moshe was of such a high char um, high level that he was uh, wanting to, to organize a new leader almost before he thought of himself. At the beginning of his leadership, he wasn't so keen on being the leader. Let's have a look at Shemot, uh, uh, chapter three. It's in the, in the Sedra of Shemot. Um, it's not should be on the screen for you now. In the last one, Johnny, you mentioned was Samachta. We use that in Sanhedrin the other week, didn't we? Yes, we did. Same fossil. I meant to mention that. Yes. Coincidentally. Um, the rest, you're right. That's um, exactly what what uh, what we were talking about. There it is in verse 18. The Samachta et Yadcha Alav Smicha. We were talking about that uh, in quite some detail, weren't we? The last couple Correct. of weeks in the Sanhedrin yeah. here. Correct. Coincidence. Um, so, yeah, there's no such thing as coincidence. No, 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 I agree. I agree. But you're right. Uh, okay, Shemot chapter 3, verse 10. And now go and I shall dispatch you to Pharaoh, and you shall take my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Moses replied to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? and that I should take the children of Israel out of Egypt. And so he said... You, so you can see there that he doesn't really want to go. Um, and, and we know that he says later on, I'm not a, a, a man of speech. Uh, I can't do it. I uh, don't want to go. And Hashem says, don't worry about it. I can make you speak if I want you to. And anyway, Aaron will be your spokesman. But you can see he's reluctant. And in the end... Hashem actually gets a bit cross with Moshe and says, stop arguing with me, you're going. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and so we can see that he was reluctant to go. Shmuel here is reluctant to go and he makes an excuse. And the response, um, the response is odd, I think. The response of God is odd to Shmuel. If you're God and Shmuel says, I don't want to go and do what you've asked me to do because I'm frightened that Shaul will kill me. And you're God. And he says that. What would you say? Philip, what would you say if you were God? I thought he was. He thinks he is. Yeah. Un <laughs> unmute yourself, Philip. I definitely do not. You're my God. <laughs> So what would you say You're to my carer? <laughs> what would you do if if you if if Shmuel said to you, "I'm frightened that Shaul will kill me," and you're God? What would you say? Trust me. Yeah, you'd say, "Don't worry about it, Shmuel. Yeah. I'm on your side. Yeah. He's not going to kill you. I'm God." That's yeah. what you would say. Trust me. Trust me. Yeah. Trust yeah. me. It'll be okay. Don't worry. Yeah. But what does he say? He says. We'll do a little shtickle. We'll do a trick. Right? And he says, verse 2, uh, Leon. But Samuel asked, 
Well, we've read this one, but Samuel asked, how can I go? If, Sa if Saul finds out, he will kill me. So Hashem said, take along a heifer and say, I have come to bring an offering to Hashem. Okay, what kind of, what kind of answer is that? God says, you're worried that Shaul will kill you. Well, pretend that you're not going to anoint another king. Why is he worried that Shaul's going to kill him? Kill the heifer instead annoying. of me. Kill the heifer instead of me. That's what he, what he, he offers to Shaul. Yeah. No, no, no. What, he's, no. what he's saying is Shmuel is worried that Shaul is going to kill him. Why? Because Shmuel is going to anoint a new king, which would signify the end of Shaul's reign. Well, Shaul doesn't want the end of his reign. This is what Shmuel is saying. And therefore, he's going to kill me. So God says, well, I'll tell you what. Why don't you go and tell a big, fat, whopping lie and say, I have come to sacrifice this heifer, this cow uh, to Hashem. And it's just all about uh, making a, a sacrifice to Hashem. And while you're there, why don't you just slip in a little bit of anointing of a king while nobody's watching. I mean, it's daft. It doesn't make any sense. The answer of Hashem should have been, you don't need to worry about Shaul killing you. You are going to do my bidding. I will protect you. Trust me. You don't have to worry about uh, Shaul killing you. And anyway, Shaul's done. We're in, we've, we've, I've rejected him. But he doesn't. He gives this excuse this this really rather strange thing, really. Um, and then he carried carry on. Um, uh, verse three, Leon. Invite Jesse to the feast. I will then tell you what to do and you shall anoint for me the one whom I shall tell you. OK, so this is part of the uh, this is part of the 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 the, the subterfuge that, that uh, God is is doing this, this subterfuge. You're going to say, I'm going to go along and say, you know what? We're going to have a, a, a sacrificial feast to Hashem. I brought this lovely heifer. We're going to um, kill it. We're going to make a, a, a sacrifice and we're going to have a, a party to Hashem. And you, Yishai, I'd like you to come uh, to the thing. And then while he's there, um, he's going to spring it on them that he's going to anoint the next king. Uh, and, and so there's a, there's a few different um, comparisons that we can see here. Uh, who can see some comparisons to what we've done previously? Yes, Johnny. Uh, not a comparison. I, I was going to ask you, in the last postdoc of the previous chapter, it says Shmuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death. Now it's going on that he's worried about seeing him again. No, yeah, that's true. It's, what we said in the last chapter is a fact. But he didn't know that at the time. Oh, that the okay. fact after the event, it turns out that Shmuel never saw Shaul again. Okay. And that's at the end of the last chapter for yeah. us, as it were, to draw a line under that story. Because then we're coming into our chapter, which is now the story yeah. of David. But um, Shmuel didn't know that at the time. He didn't know that Shaul wasn't going to be waiting and lying in wait for him. If he would announce that he's going to go and announce, he's going to go and anoint the next king, well, the current king is going to say, I'm not having that. And he'd wait in, in, uh, uh, in, 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 wait in lie in ambush for him uh, and kill him. And that's what ostensibly... Where, 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 about. Is, where is Givat Sha'ol, where Saul went to in relationship to Bethlehem? Or where he's going well, to? Well, let's have a look at the map. That's a good question. Um, it's not far, it's in the same sort of central area. Yeah. But let's have a look, it's a good question. Let's go on to a map and see. Have a look. So let's put in Givat Sha'ol. Givat Sha'ol. There's Givat Shaul. Okay. And now let's put in Bethlehem. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, there it is on the screen. Can you see it? Yeah. It's 12 kilometers. Oh, okay. Very close. So you would have heard, yeah. Okay. Very close. But good question, that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So back to Shmuel. So um, he, the, the Hashem says to him, go on and do this, this little trickery um, and we'll just slip in the anointing of the king, as it were, while nobody's looking. So any, anyone see any comparisons uh, in what we've said here? How was Shaul anointed? Shaul well, was anointed. Top, he was anointed twice, wasn't he? Went well, to the, the top of the hill, didn't he? Yes. The first yes. time yeah. he was anointed at the top of the hill yeah. with nobody there, just yeah. Shmuel and Shaul. Oh. Okay. So there's a comparison there. It was done almost sort of on the quiet, as it were. So the first anointing of Shaul. It's going to be very similar, or the, the anointing of David is going to be a similar to the anointing, the first anointing of Shaul. It's going to be on the quiet. And um, there's another comparison here. Um, look at verse three again, please, um, and uh, see if you can spot something that we, we have heard before. Verse three again, Leon. Invite Jesse to the feast. I will then tell you what to do, and you shall anoint for me the one whom I shall tell you. Okay, what, what in that pasuk have you heard before? The, uh, the, um, the anointment. The anointment. Yes, yes, yes that, that's the same. Yeah, Hashem has said to uh, Shmuel, I'll tell you who to anoint. That's true. Uh, when Shaul first arrived when he was looking for his donkeys, if you remember, um, Shmuel didn't know who the, the king was going to be, and he doesn't know now who the king is going to be. Uh, that's uh, one comparison. There's another one that we have in there. He, he told uh, Shaul to wait for him. Yes. Look at this. I shall tell you, I shall let you know what you shall do, okay? I shall let you know what you shall do. Um, do you remember when Shaul made one of his first errors, what did he do? Shmuel told him, go down to Gilgal and wait for me, and I shall tell you what to do. And Shaul thought that he was late, that Shmuel was late, and he didn't wait, did he? He didn't wait. And that was his first mistake. He thought Shmuel's not coming. Um, and he went and sacrificed himself instead of waiting. This idea of, uh, uh, of obedience, here it's obedience by Shmuel to Hashem, in contrast to the lack of obedience of Shaul to Shmuel. And I just wonder whether Hashem is using this uh, idea to remind Shmuel that his guy, Shaul, who he seems to be very fond of, um, did not do what he was asked to do in terms of waiting. Uh, he took it upon himself. And it's a sort of a hint to Shmuel that, um, you know, you shouldn't be so feel so bad that Shaul has lost his kingship because, uh, you know, he, he wasn't the guy for the job. Um, and in contrast to what Shaul did, look at the beginning of verse four, the first few words. So Samuel did as Hashem had spoken. Stop there. Samuel did as Hashem had spoken, in brackets and unspoken, not like Shaul, who didn't do, as Shmuel had spoken. This is Hashem, as it were, easing Shmuel off his desire for Shaul to continue. 
But He's when giving it, him these Shmuel, little hints. Johnny, Johnny, isn't Shmuel subordinate to Hashem? Uh, uh, Hashem ordered, uh, he, 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 he gave an order, but Shmuel gave an order to Shaul, but Shmuel was subordinate to Hashem. So if, if Shaul didn't uh, uh, obey the order of Shmuel, it wasn't as serious as him not obeying the order of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Isn't that right? Of course. You're absolutely right. And in, and in fact, you're absolutely right, because when Shaul did not obey the commandment of Shmuel at yeah. Gilgal, he didn't yeah. lose his kingship for it. No. It was just a, a, a naughty thing to do. He didn't listen to the Navi. When he disobeyed the commandment of Hashem with Agag, then that was it. it yeah, was, yeah, it was yeah. it was over. So you're right, but yeah. it's a comparison there, using the same sort of language, just to give us a little hint that Hashem is is easing Shmuel away from Shaul. Um, and so uh, let's carry on and see what happens. Verse four. So Samuel did as Hashem had spoken, and he arrived in Bethlehem. The elders of the city hurried nervously toward him, and one of them said, Do you come in peace? And he answered, Peace. To bring an offering to Hashem have I come. Prepare yourselves and join me at the feast. And he invited Jesse and his sons, calling them to the feast. Okay, let's stop there. So uh, this is the ruse. Um, and let's just have a look uh, at chapter 9. Okay, this is when uh, um, we first were introduced to Saul, to Shaul. And... Uh, if we have a look at chapter nine, the first thing that we hear about Shaul, well, actually, the only thing we really hear about Shaul at the beginning is what? Verse two, Leon. He had a son named Saul who was exceptional and goodly. No one in Israel was handsomer than he. From his shoulders up, he was taller than any of the people. OK, so the only thing that we're told about Shaul at the beginning is about his good looks. He was a good looking fellow. He was tall, head and shoulders taller than anyone else. And he was, there was nobody that was more handsome than uh, than Shaul. Now, if you were... Um, choosing the character traits or the you were choosing the kind of person that you wanted to be king you wouldn't really choose on the basis of their good looks you would be choosing them on the basis of their suitability to be king their leadership qualities their uh, ability to uh, look after the weak and the vulnerable uh, their uh, their fighting ability, maybe uh, in in this kind of situation, uh, being handsomer than anybody else. I'm still not sure about that word handsomer. Is Michael around? We'll have to ask him. Uh, Michael, is there a word handsomer? We can't hear you, Michael. You're muted. Yeah. Yes, I look at myself every day in the mirror. <laughs> okay. Well, Michael is handsomer and handsomer every day. <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, the the the, the uh, character. Michael, trait I knew you were a four eyes. <laughs> you're a four eyes. That's why you think you're handsome. <laughs> the the character traits are not mentioned here. The only thing that's mentioned in Shaul is the fact that he was handsome, and it seems to be that he was uh, uh, chosen on the basis of his good looks. A bit odd because it's God that did the choosing. Uh, however, that is the fact. And we know, of course, now, because we're not in chapter nine anymore, we're in chapter 16, we know that it all went wrong, that Shaul turned out not to be the correct man for the job. Uh, and so you'd expect, wouldn't you, when we try again, that 
the character traits that they're looking for would not be those of good looks. That sounds re uh, reasonable, a reasonable assumption, yeah? That, um, that Did God make a mistake then, in Shaw? Did God make Sorry, a mistake? Johnny? Did God make a mistake then in picking uh, Shaul? Well, uh, God himself says he regretted making yeah. Shaul the king. I don't know we can say God made a mistake. I think mm. that we can say it looks like God made a mistake yeah. in our eyes. And I pre perhaps that is, it's presented in that way so that um, we can learn from it. Uh, well, it it's difficult it's because, for us to... Sorry, maybe it's because he was the first king and the king, the, the people were clamoring for a king. They wanted somebody and and so maybe because he had this physical um the physical looks that he would be impressive to the people i'm, I'm sure that's king. right anita yes that that uh, and maybe thinking about it as you were speaking then maybe it was as it were god did it deliberately to show the people that if you choose a king well, they didn't choose him. I mean, uh, God chose him. But if uh, let's put it in a passive form. If a king is chosen on the basis of what he looks like, as opposed to uh, his suitability to be king, then it's all going to end in tears, which is what happened with Shaul. Uh, and, and the signs were there from the beginning, weren't they? When he was anointed for the second time, he ran away. Um, and then he made a mistake with uh, Shmuel. He made another mistake with Jonathan. And then finally, he made the fatal mistake um, with Agag. Uh, and then it was over. So uh, what's interesting is that it seems that Shaul was chosen on the basis of his looks. And we would expect, let's say it the way, as it were, we'd expect Hashem not to make the same mistake again. And we'd expect Shmuel to also have learnt a lesson from that. But let's see what actually happens when Shmuel comes to Yishai, makes his sacrifice to Hashem. Imagine the scenario. He's come, Shmuel, remember, is, is well known. Uh, he's in Bethlehem. It's his patch. He's only 12 kilometers from uh, Bethlehem, from, uh, from Givat Shaul. Let's see. Remember where Shmuel's, uh, do you remember where Shmuel's stronghold was? Anybody remember? Before I put it on the map. Gilgal? Not Gilgal. Gilgal was where, well, it was one of those Gilgal is right. Gilgal is where the, the Mishkan was. But there is a, another place which is notably um, um, Shm uh, Shmuel's hangout. And it begins with a Raish. Anyone? On the tip of Leon's tongue, I can see. Yeah. Ramah. Ramah. Remember? So let's see. Ramah was Shmuel's stronghold. Let's see where Ramah is in relation to uh, here. There it is. Even nearer. Ramah. That's where it is. It's the same sort of area here. Even nearer than Bethlehem. <coughs> Bless you. Excuse me. Abriot. Abriot. E thank you. Even nearer to Bethlehem than Givat Shmuel. It's eight kilometers from Givat from Bethlehem. So um, Shmuel was certainly known in Bethlehem. Shmuel was the Navi. He was the leader. Okay, he wasn't the king anymore, but he was the spiritual leader. Um, and it's impossible that Yishai would not have known who he was. Uh, and that's why I think um, Yishai and all the elders of the city, um, in verse four, came to him and said, are you coming in peace? If you were the elders of a city, minding your own business, and suddenly the governor general or the Navi starts to approach your city. You're going to worry, aren't you? You're going to think, oh, Ive, what have we done wrong? It's like, you know, the chief of police is on his way. And so the first thing they say is, Shalom Boecha, uh, are you coming in peace or, or are we in trouble? 
Um, so it's not like they, they didn't know who Shmuel was. Shmuel was a uh, an important figure um, who um, I've had a message from Michael to say that handsomer is a valid word. Baruch Hashem. Um, so uh, uh, they want to know whether Shmuel's visit to the city is because they're in trouble or because he's coming in peace. And he says, no, I've come in peace. I'm come to slaughter uh, to Hashem, and I'm inviting Yishai uh, and his sons to, to partake. Now, if you are sitting, minding your own business in Beit Lechem, and out of the blue, the Navi of Hashem turns up and invites you to a sacrificial feast, what are you going to think? I, I, that's strange. <laughs> yes, you're going to think you're in I, I, favor, I, that you that you're being favored, that you're you're a person who's who's yeah. in the uh, in the spotlight, and that you're 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 okay. You're 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 on your way up. Yeah, I think that's right because first of all, you're going to think, "Am I in trouble?" That will be my first uh, uh, um, uh, thought. Well, they've said that he's not in trouble. He's, he's asked him, "Are you coming in peace?" And he says, don't worry, Shmuel says, you're not in trouble. I've come in peace. Everything's OK. And you know what? I'm inviting you, Yishai, and your sons to come to a special uh, feast to Hashem. Well, now that you know you're not in trouble, if you've been invited, you're the, now the Ganser Knacker. You're on the, on the top table there, Hoycha Fensters, in, in, with Shmuel, the, the Novi. Then you're going to think, oh, hello, something's going on here. What, I, I must be, uh, why am I in favour? Well... Let's have a look um, and uh, bear in mind what we've just learnt and re recapped on the uh, appointment of Shaul as king because of his good looks. Look what happens in uh, verse six. I just say something, Johnny. Yeah. Because at three, Rabbi Steinsel says that Shmuel knew that Saul was going to be the king. And in this instance, he doesn't know who's going to be the king. And he thinks that uh, it's just to show that he's, he wasn't perfect himself. God hadn't told him at this stage. If I've got it ready correctly. God did not inform Samuel before I knew he was to appoint king. The sages interpret this as a hint to the prophet of some flaw in his conduct. On the previous occasion... Ah, yes, yes, yes. Uh, I was going to mention this. Yes. Um, yes. Um, OK, that's a good point. Well, thank you for pointing that out. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it in a minute. Um, let's go on here um, and verse six, Leon. And it was upon their arrival that Samuel saw Eliab. He said, surely before Hashem is his anointed one. OK, so what does Shmuel say? He sees this first chap, Eliab, who um, was the oldest of Yishai's children, all he knows is that one of Yishai's children is going to be king. If you have a look at, at verse 1, um, Kodesh Baruch Hu says, I will send you to Yishai, for I have seen for myself a king amongst his sons. So he does know that one of the sons of Yishai is going to be king, but he doesn't know which one it is. He's not told which king it is. So um, he comes along, <laughs> Yishai comes along with his sons. Um, and he sees, Shmuel sees the first one, Eliav, who was the uh, oldest. And what does he say to himself? So, yeah. He says, this must be the one. Why did he say that? Why did he say that? Progenitor. Because he's the Bechor. Okay, because he's the Bechor. Okay, fair enough, but I don't think that's what Hashem thinks. Hashem knows what he thought. And we know what, what uh, and if Hashem knows what he thought, we can find out what he thought from Hashem's response. Uh, look at verse 7. But Hashem said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his tall stature, for
for I have rejected him. For it is not as man sees, man sees what his eyes behold, but Hashem sees into the heart. Okay, let's stop there. So, uh, Hashem says to Shmuel, no, 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 you've got it wrong. It's not Eliab. You thought it was Eliab because of his appearance and his height and his stature, but it's not so. And and in brackets, we've made that mistake once before, haven't we, Shmuel? Right? When we appointed Shaul, we appointed him, chapter 9, verse 2, we appointed him because he was head and shoulders above everybody else. So it seems that Shmuel has not taken on board the message. And he's looked at Eliav and seen a big, tall, strapping lad who's a handsome guy, uh, handsomer than anybody else around. Um, and he says he must be the one. And the Shem says, no, he's not the one. Uh, and then this is what uh, Johnny's referring to. There's a little bit of a, a, a criticism here to, uh, uh, to Shmuel. Because he says, it is not as man sees. A man sees what he sees with his eyes, but Hashem sees into the heart. Um, When Shmuel was crowned as king, uh, Shmuel, sorry, when Shaul was crowned as king, and Shaul says, what you... What are you giving me this for? I'm just a, a, a lowly Benjaminite. Let's see if we can find it. I haven't got it ready, but uh, it must be in chapter 10, I am guessing. Uh, that's not right. That's schmutz. Uh, I'm guessing it'll be in chapter 10. Oh, here it is. No, it's in chapter 9. Uh Yeah. Shout. Where is it? <laughs> Here we go, found it. Verse 19. Verse 19 there in chapter 9. <clears throat> now let's go, let's go, let's go uh, uh, on uh, uh, over that. Um, go start from uh, verse 17, Leon, in chapter 9. Yeah. Saul approached Samuel inside the city gate and said, Tell me, please, which is the house of the seer? Samuel answered Saul, saying, I am the seer. Go up before me up to the high place, and you shall eat with me today. I will send you away in the morning, and I will tell you whatever is in your heart. Okay, let's stop there. So, first of all, let's look at the Hebrew here. Shaul, uh, remember, has lost his donkeys and his lad has suggested that they go to Shmuel and Avi to see if he can give them some help in finding the donkeys. And Shaul says to his lad, good idea, let's do that. And they get to the place and he says to the people, Hagida Nali, tell me please, Eze Beit ha ha the seer. Um, if I didn't know better, I would say that seer wasn't a word, um, but uh, it must be a word because it's here. Uh, but it's not a word that we would use uh, regularly. Uh, you would, I would have translated that, uh, uh, which is the house of the man of vision. Uh, but anyway, Aroeh, the seer. And Shmuel says to Shaul, Anochi Haroeh, I am the seer. I am the one who sees and now if we go back to our chapter, uh, Shmuel says to himself, I have seen Vayar et Eliav. He saw Eliav. He saw the same word. That's is just the past tense. He saw Eliav and he said, this must be the one. And Hashem said, Shem said to him, no, no, don't look at his appearance. A man only sees what his 
eyes show him. This is Hashem uh, criticizing Shmuel um, for calling himself a seer back then. He's only a seer as, as to the degree that a human being can see unless he's given extra vision, as it were, supervision by HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And so here Hashem is saying, no, we've made this mistake before. Don't look at his appearance. Um, we, and if you go along with what uh, Anita's idea, which I like a lot, which is that Shaul was appointed as the king because that was what a, the people uh, wanted their king to look like. Again, it's a visual thing. Um, this time they're saying, no, we've tried that. It didn't work. Uh, we're now going to go for quality as opposed to quantity. We're not going to go on appearance. We're going to go what is in the heart of uh, the person. And this is what he says. Uh, uh, same word. Hashem sees lalev into the heart. But, you know, this idea of, of getting a uh, of, of a, an appearance being sort of uh, regal or majestic or presidential, it's a very, very powerful thing. Um, uh, you, you'll all you'll all know uh, Alan Singer, right from our shul. My kids call him the American president because they think they don't know his name. And whenever we talk about him, they'll say, "You know, the one, the American president." Why? Because he's tall and he's upright and he's got gr great posture and he holds himself well and he's got a, a, a beautiful head of grey hair and he's a good-looking fellow. And, and that's if you were casting the American president in in a, in a film, you know he'd be at the front of the queue. You wouldn't have. No, 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 no. I would be. You, Philip, you're too I small. Look like Eisenhower. I look you're too like small, Eisenhower. Philip. You're too small. You're bald. No, 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 no. <laughs> Eisenhower was too. <laughs> yeah, but if you were if you were casting the the president, you'd cast Alan Singer in the in the role. And this is what Shattle was like. Shattle was the. Was, was the Alan Singer of his time there. And that's why he was given that role. But it didn't work. And that's not to say that Alan wouldn't make a good president. I'm sure he would. Uh, but here, uh, Akadish Baruch Hu is saying, no, no, we're not looking at appearances. We're looking at what's in the heart. Uh, and we're, we're, we're moving on from appearances. We were, we're no longer superficial. Um, so he says, I'm rejecting it because that's not uh, as it is. So let's did, Shmuel, on... just, did Shmuel actually ask God, is this the map? I don't understand that possible. He said, okay, it, so he he's said dead. probably right, you're there, dead. and he's dead. Well, he won't have said it to anybody else. He'd either have said it to God or to himself. He said probably um, to himself. Yeah. yeah, I think he said it to himself. Yeah. And Hashem sort of put, you know, he's he's got the he's got the uh, you know the thingy in his ear to Hashem, uh, uh, and he says. Hashem, I think this is the guy. And he says, what? No, no, he's not the guy. Right, move on. Um, so he's having this conversation there with, with God. God says, no, this is not the right one. Um, and carry on, verse 8, Leon. Jesse, <coughs> Jesse, excuse me. <coughs> Jesse then called Ab Abinadab and brought him before Samuel. But he said, Hashem has not chosen this one either. Okay, how does he know that? How does Shmuel know that um, Hashem has not chosen Avinadav? Second eldest. Yeah, but how does he know he's not chosen him? He says, neither has the Lord chosen this one. And then go on verse 9 and verse he 10, Leo. He didn't tell him to anoint him. Otherwise, if he, that was the if he were the chosen one, he would have said, this is the one, anoint him. Okay, I think that's, that's quite straightforward. Um, so he brings him and uh, he's got his little thing in his ear and he's waiting for Hashem to say, yes, that's the one. Avi Nadav comes, Gornish, doesn't hear a thing. What? No, it's not him. Verse 9. Then Jesse brought Shama, but Samuel said, Hashem has not chosen this one either. Jesse presented his seven sons before Samuel, but Samuel said to Jesse, Hashem has not chosen these. So now we've got a bit of a problem, haven't we? 
because Hashem has said to Shmuel at the beginning, I've seen a son that I fancy as a king, or a son of Yishai that I fancy as a king. And now Yishai has presented seven sons, and Hashem has said, basically, nothing. Garnished. He's not the one. He's not the one. Don't like that one. He's too small, too fat, too thick, whatever. Uh, so what's Shmuel going to do now? He's in trouble. <clears throat> Maybe he's got the wrong Yishai. Maybe it was Yishai the, the cobbler, not Yishai the horse thief or whatever. Okay. Why does it not mention the name of the other sons? I was thinking that just now, actually, John. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, mm. we'll, but, we'll, but we'll come to the names of the other sons in a minute, actually, if we've got okay. time. Maybe not this time, but next week. Uh, I don't know, actually, why. Uh, maybe just stylistic. Um, um, the first so Shang Tsao was... said it's unclear whether Samuel told Ishai why he was actually there. Um, I, think he must have done, I think he must have done at this point. because It's unclear whether... Some... He must have done, because he says... The Lord has not chosen this one. So yeah. chosen him for what? Um, so I think that, the, as we said before, if you're Yishai and you've been invited to dinner with the, with the, uh, with the priest of God, you know something's going on. Um, and so I think, I think he, he must have told Yishai at this point what it was all about. So Yishai present, presents all seven sons and he says, no, not these. So Shmuel is now wondering what to do. Has he got the right Yishai? Maybe there's more children that he hasn't shown me. Verse 11. Samuel said, are these all the boys? And he said, <clears throat> the youngest one is still left. He is tending the sheep now. So Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him. For we will not sit to dine until he arrives here. OK, so Shmuel now uh, is pinning all his hopes on the youngest son. Now, if he is the youngest son and Yishai has presented his seven sons before him, then David must be what? What's the question Why? again, Joey? He must be the one. If the other must didn't. be what number son is he? Eight. eight. He's number eight. Okay. He's number eight. What's special about number eight? The Shiach. Eight is beyond. Eight beyond is the one. eight is the number me'al hateva. Uh, it's above nature. We have a cycle of seven, don't we? Seven is a very uh, complete number. Seven days of the week, seven years of Shemitah, seven Shemitahs for a Yovel, okay? Seven is the, is the number of completion. Eight is the number above that. It's above uh, the nature. It's called Me'al HaTeva. Shmona is the number above nature. What day do we do a Brit Mila? The eighth day. The eighth day. Uh, the day where we are close, closest to our Kaddish Baruch Hu is the day of Shmini Atzeret. Why are we close to our Kaddish Baruch Hu? Because there's no reason for that Yom Tov other than a Yom Tov to be close to Hashem. Pesach is Yitziat Mitzrayim. Shavuot is Bikurim, uh, uh, Matan Torah, if you like. Sukkot is because you dwelt in Sukkot. But Shmini Atzeret uh, is when all the other nations have gone. Sukkot is the, is the Yom Tov of the nations. All the nations used to come and give their, uh, their sacrifices in the temple. But then they went away. And it was just us and HaKadosh Baruch Hu for Shmini Atzeret. Eight recognizes something special. The number eight is something special. Uh, Ronaldo's number eight. Sorry? Ronaldo's number eight. Ronaldo's oh. number seven. Seven, <laughs> and I'm not even sure he's that anymore. No, <laughs> we shan't discuss that this morning. No, um, so, uh, so David is number eight, and there's something symbolic about that, but it's very interesting, and we haven't got time to go into it today. Next week, please, God, we'll go into uh, 
and I'll show you Divrei Hayamim. Um, if you want to look it up, uh, it is Divrei Hayamim Aleph, cha chapter two, which goes through all the genealogy. Yeah. And there, it seems to be that David is the seventh son and not the eighth son. Uh, and so we have to uh, uh, explain that discrepancy and we'll do that next week. So Eight right days of Hanukkah as well, aren't there? Eight, yes, that's good. That's that's true. Um, eight eight uh, days of Hanukkah. Um, that being a, a miracle, Me'ala Teva, the metness of, uh, of Hanukkah was uh, eight days of the Hanukkah Tabayit um, as well. So eight is a very special number. David is the eighth son. Um, and um, we will uh, just do verses, just read verses 12 and 13 now before we finish. Um, and um, uh, maybe even verse 14. Um, no, we'll just do verse 12 and 13, uh, and then we'll pick, pick it up again next week. Verse 12. He sent and brought him. He was ruddy with fair eyes and a pleasing appearance. Hashem then said, Arise and anoint him, for this is he. Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of Hashem passed over David from that day on. Then Samuel arose and went to Ramah. Okay, we'll stop there and we'll discuss these two psukim in detail uh, next time. I've just been chastised by Michael. It's not genealogy. Uh, what is it, Michael? Genealogy. <laughs> genealogy. And I've made that mistake before. So uh, um, I, I need to uh, I need to ask Michaela from Michael uh, uh, for making that mistake. It's genealogy and not genealogy. Um, it should be genealogy. Everything else is an ology. You have proctology and you have dermatology. And, they'll, and all that ologies. So why should this be? An, why should this be an allergy? Uh, I, I'm not happy, but I accept and, and bow to your superior knowledge, Michael. But I'm not happy. And I did all right. Say, I did say with respect as well. With respect, that just means there isn't any. When you say with all due respect, that just means there isn't any respect due at all. Okay. So, any questions or comments on what we've done today? I just want to say this: introducing David. Um, Again, it's physical, you know, beautiful eyes, handsome, again. So we're yeah. going to talk about that next week. That's a very important point. Okay. Uh, we need to read that Pasuk, verse 11, um, together with verse 7. Yes, because he's contradicting, isn't he? It is. And we'll talk about that contradiction next week. Okay. Uh, as they say, hold that thought. Okay. And think about it for a whole week. Any other comments or, or questions? There's a picture. Okay. There's a picture of the Stein cells of the anointing. The picture of the Stein cells and the end of the anointing. Here. Which page there. is it on? There. Oh yes, there it is. I'll take a picture of that for next week, and I'll uh, I'll send it round. Yes. It's a, fresco. Fresco, it's a fresco from a, the Dura Europos synagogue in third the third century. century CE. Wow, that's quite old. There's only seven boys on that picture, though. You're right. Maybe that's a picture depicting Divrei Hayamim and not Shmuel Aleph. Good point. Yeah. Well spotted. All right. Shavua Tov, everyone. Excuse me, Michael. Michael, we'll continue with Gemara. We'll continue with Shatzah. There is genealogy Billy. and there is genealogy. Genealogy is the science of uh, of uh, families, and ge uh, genealogy yeah. is um, is um, something else. But it, it's there are two two. Uh, expressions genealogy and genealogy and johnny was right michael i'm sorry it's genealogy in his case in the case oh, that he was using. Oh, philip i've okay. never loved you so much in all my life <laughs> just tell it's, michael it's he not disappeared often that i think that philip is right but of course on this occasion <laughs> philip spot on
Michael and I will debate you can check it, genealogy you can check I just check genealogy. Genealogy is a science, and genealogy is a particular uh, a particular history. Fantastic. Oh. Who says Tanakh is boring? Right. <laughs> Shavua Tov, everyone. <laughs> Gemara Shkir on Wednesday. <laughs> Leon, I'll give you a call in a minute to uh, talk about timings, okay? Right. <laughs> right. Cheerio. Shavua Tov, everyone. Shavua Tov. Good to have you back.